Manager, this one has your name on it, precursor to budget proposal. So, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, we have the privilege of having uh, Lieutenant Colonel Barbara West, who's going to present the first part of uh, this uh, component. The second is going to be uh, presented by Jaleesa Turner. The premise here is that as we go into the budget, I have a group working on uh, crime and youth violence. The, one of the focal points that you are going to see in this budget is an out, a significant allocation for additional resources for our police department and additional resources to combat youth violence, uh, namely in the realm of 501 c three organizations and what we can do uh, with different groups. So without further ado, and thank you, because I think I have seen you on how many night meetings in the past couple of weeks. You've been everywhere. Absolutely. Thank you. Just now crossing over your first year. Yep. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair, my Vice Chair, and all the boards of the Super, the Board of Supervisors members, and Mr. County Manager, and all the participants that are out there in the WebEx land. I just wanted to share with you a national overview of what crime is looking like and what's happening nationally. So just to add, the crime is actually spiking all over the country, you know, especially in the major cities, we're seeing a significant uptick where record-breaking numbers are actually happening in major cities in terms of the homicides, and they're currently the ones that are trending this national violence uptick. Um, the youth crime and victimization is on the rise. There's no chance that you cannot look at the media or any type of newspaper where you don't see an individual, a youth that's been engaged in maybe a carjacking or a shooting or robbery being the victim there or being the offender in that particular case. And so we're seeing our youth being taken too soon. According to the CDC, what I found is that, you know, youth with certain risk behaviors and experiences and community risk factors are more likely to participate in these negative behaviors and activities. Such behaviors as being an experience in being a previous victim of violence, um, also as being a witness to violence or an offender. Uh, they sometimes come from unstable homes, um, lack of parental support, absence of parents due to incarceration or drug abuse, there's social rejection and bullying, and there's involvement in gangs and poverty. They have access to use of weapons, and they have access to use of drugs and alcohol. And without the support of supportive adults, mentoring programs, and police athletic leagues, and after school programs and other counselors and conflict resolution classes, we see that many of them will actually continue on this actual path. When we look at our crime in the county, we're seeing that we had 25 homicides this year, and we had 135 robberies, 215 assaults, as well as 95 fatal overdoses. Uh, we saw an uptick in our crime last year, and our county crime uh, has been going down. Uh, we have reductions in uh, burglaries, large supermodels, but we've seen that catalytic converters as well as auto theft still continue to be a trend. When I look at the homicides and just specifically those, I see that they're a trauma to the family and a trauma to the community. And when we're actually going out there to respond to these things, we have to manage those things effectively. We want to make sure that we are resourced properly in terms of finding all the evidence. I've been out on scenes where we have lots of streets covered uh, with vehicles uh, that we're actually manning traffic control. We're actually on crime scenes watching evidence, uh, doing canvases, and that takes a substantial amount of manpower to do that. All in all, at the same time, though, we're seeing that uh, we're still getting our calls for service. Our call for service are continuing, and we're making sure that we're trying to manage that and prevent other crimes from actually happening in our community. Um, while managing that, we're answering all those calls for mental health services. Uh, last year in 2021, we had over 3,400 mental health service calls. We're averaging about 10 mental health service calls per day. And we're also managing our temporary detention orders um, that have increased. One day last week, we even had where we had to settle eight individuals uh, for TDO. 
our crisis intervention team, they're doing a phenomenal job and they're helping us to manage these increases in calls for service. However, with the current increase in those calls, uh, we're going to eventually get to the point where we're stretching them too thin and they can't be as, as effective as they need to be. In 2021, when you look at our juvenile data, we've seen some stark things that are happening. Seven juveniles have been accidentally injured during a fire incident. We're seeing that 17 juveniles have been injured in a fire incident, and two of them have been fatally shot. And these are individuals between the ages of 13 and 17 years old. We're seeing that 81 fire discharge incidents occurred last year, where there was either a victim with or without injuries, they were shot at into a car or dwelling, or was a witness to a shooting, or they were arrested for a discharge. In 2020, we had um, 11 accidental shootings, and I'm sorry, four accidental shootings, seven were not accidental, and we only had 11 general shootings, shooting victims involving juveniles. So I'm seeing that we are seeing an uptick in 2021. I'd like to share with you a couple of stories, and these are things that are currently happening that put a little bit more light on what we're seeing. On um, mid-October 2021, one of our officers was responding to a shooting. He arrived on the scene and he located a juvenile who had, had sustained a gunshot to the neck. Uh, he began to render aid, waiting for fire to be dispatched and to arrive on the scene. And when fire arrived on the scene, and prior to fire arriving on the scene, a subject driving a vehicle, driving at a fast rate of speed, actually um, ran into a stop sign. Uh, jumped out of the vehicle, brandishing two firearms. The story is so significant is because it was a juvenile that was shot in that vehicle, and the subject who jumped out brandishing the firearms was also a juvenile, and the actual suspect was a juvenile in this incident. So that's one trend that we're seeing. Um, in late October of 2021, uh, one of our school resource officers was contacted and informed that there may be a student in possession of a firearm. Uh, given that information and collaborating with the administration, uh, they were able to identify the student juvenile who was in the school, and they were able to bring that um, subject out of the office and begin to have that discussion. The subject at juvenile stated that he, you know, had a little marijuana on him, but he wasn't willing to send it to a search. But however, he would do so after his parents did uh, say that it was okay to do the search. Um, while conducting the search, they did discover that he had a weapon in his backpack um, and he had stated that it was a ghost gun. He had actually ordered the parts in line. He was able to put it together. He um, said he carried it everywhere he went and he carried it every day. And the reason why he did this is because one of his family members had been the victim of gun violence the previous year. I want to share with you another story in terms of what we saw right before Christmas break. Um, one of our SROs, again, was doing walking through the parking lot, just checking the line and smell marijuana. Uh, indicated that, you know, I saw four juveniles sitting in a vehicle, one of them exited, had a very distinguishable jacket on, um, went into the school, the other three left in the vehicle. Uh, he observed the one, four students all come back to the school, and then he actually said he would go and take a look in the parking lot to make sure everything was okay. He observed a car that they were actually in, and he went around the car, and he noticed that there was a white box that was sitting underneath the seat, which he knew from his training and his experience that that to be a box uh, where they would buy another type of gun that you could put together, a gun kit. Uh, he was able to work with the administration to actually identify the actual uh, subjects. Um, they were brought in, the administrative search was conducted, and in that vehicle, they discovered an upper level, lower level, all the parts that you would need to put together an actual gun. Um, just the next slide is going to show you what these gun kits actually look like, and you can find them online. Um, Give me some information from ATF. That, you know, it takes about 20 minutes to put these kits together. Uh, also, you can find all the instructions in terms of putting these kits together uh, on any kind of social media platform. But just to make a point to that last particular picture, that is a real gun that we discovered, we recovered last week in one of our students' vehicles at a school. It is a assault type weapon. It's a nine millimeter with a thirty-four clip round extended magazine, and that's what we recovered. You said the one thirty-four. You said the one on our right. 
it's a matter of right to an assault rifle, I mean, assault weapon in a student's car. Yes, sir, on parking facilities, I'm already know. Right. It's just kind of felt out next to the bottom. Those other two are just gun kits where you can order online. And again, ATF has said that you can just order these without having any type of identifying information. Um, you can just get them, put them together. It takes about 20 minutes according to what ATF has revealed to us. So just to say that, you know, the calls that we actually receiving are becoming very complex. Um, we're trying to manage our resources uh, and, and do more depth problems and having to get to some of these situations where we're seeing um, many of them all. Us. Many of them have mental health components. They have these risk factors that we're seeing, and they're coupled with a lot of trauma, and they require more time and more resources. I was riding with a sergeant supervisor. Um, he received a call about a domestic situation, and he was involving a young man and his grandmother, and he had been sent to his grandmother because his mother was having substance abuse issues, and the young man was not being respectful to his grandmother at all. In fact, he was running the house. Um, the officer had been to the residence before, a few days before, and determined that he really needed to locate some resources for this young man and for the grandmother. Um, the officer began to work with this young man to get him some resources. Um, he decided, you know, he needed some counseling to deal with his mental health trauma that he was experiencing. And that, that in turn actually helped his grandmother, who was actually a Witsy. And I'm proud that our officers actually took the time to develop some permanent solutions and not just take the time just to answer the call and complete it. Thank you for your time. This concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. So again, you've got, uh, you will see a focus in the budget, and uh, we have a group, uh, Amy Cashwell, uh, Chief English, uh, Commonwealth's Attorney, and some others, uh, De uh, Deputy County Manager Tony McDowell, Monica Callahan, uh, working on this. But ultimately, we have to have both additional resources on the ground. I mean, I, I, some of this, and you, you've only just touched, you know, some of what we have seen this year. And then on the 501c3 side, there are some additional organizations I think that could be helpful. I actually have a question at the thought of it. Um, I, I know it's not totally done and, and all that about marijuana being legal. It isn't legal for anyone under what, 21? Yes, so there's a there's a there's an age limit for marijuana. Yeah, and any student is under 18 years old. Definitely. And 18 and also school property definitely. I mean, you know, there's certain restrictions that have marijuana. I wanted to share that I have passed out to you some information that's on um, crime statistics for your uh, the county, and it is broken down by magisterial district. The reason I say that is I know we had the drug sniffing dogs. Save any of them? I mean, do we still have any? Would yeah, they not be useful at school? Stars. Would they not be useful at school? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. No. No. Um, you, I have a couple of questions. So, thank you for sharing those stories. And yes, we have, <clears throat> we got last month from um, the chief a breakdown. Crime is up in cities. I'm sure you're a heck of a lot. If that's for me, just take a message. Tell them we're in the middle of a meeting. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you're happy to be out of Chicago and here where uh, in Henrico, I, I'm with you. Uh, the, what is it you said we, we need more resources? In your professional opinion, what do we need? I mean, if, if you go down the stats in Henrico, crime is up 100%. Agree? It, it's down, it's down. Okay, homicides. Um, I, I, there are a couple categories, you're right. That we should look at and say, isn't that great? That burglaries are down. Uh, but you, you, you go through, crime is up. What do we need to fix that? 
So, so to, in my professional opinion, I, you know, we look at balancing what we have to do with in terms of current trends, right? Uh, we see that, you know, we're responding to a violent crime, which creates uh, a manpower drain on some of our resources. And so when those resources are dedicated to that particular incident, they're unable to address the other crime that could potentially happen um, and to be a visible presence to prevent crime from happening. And so when you talk about um, resourcing, I think that's one thing we do need additional. Um, when we speak to CIT, um, we're seeing an uptick in that mental health call component being part of a lot of the calls and having them have the ability to get ahead of that and to begin to um, address some of those individuals so that they don't become crisis, um, so they don't need to be TDO'd or ECO'd, then I think that would be another significant area we could um, see some potential to have. Um, when I think about what I'm seeing in the schools, I see that there's a potential for additional mentoring and how activities so that we have other things that we can direct you to so that they're not um, directing themselves in the, into these behaviors. Because like I mentioned earlier, really, they need the supportive they need the supportive activities in order to deflect some of those conflicts and some of those risk factors that they're dealing with. And I think we have the opportunity to do that. And we um, just heard this morning with schools. I mean they're 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 leap they are propelling this county leaps and bounds with wraparound services and and hubs. And and that that was a new concept that I think is absolutely fantastic. So if we need more boots on the ground, are we saying 50? Are we saying 150? Are we saying 300? What, in your opinion, what number should we be looking at? So, and so, uh, Mr. Brandon, let me, uh, Lieutenant Carl's been here a year, so she she's got she's a little bit at a disadvantage. I've been having conversations with Chief English, and the working number that we have is fifty. So fifty over five years, with a potential of doing it quicker. So which, let, is, what, which is what we did a couple of years. Yes, sir. I mean, we've been doing ten year ten, ten a year. We've done that before. Yeah. So it was a conversation also that I had. With Lieutenant Colonel West, recall on mental health, you know, you've got all these police officers that are that are not on the street, not doing their job because they're sitting with someone that needs to be in a hospital or a state hospital or a state facility. So that's additive. I, and I was just done with the sheriff two weeks ago, mm -hmm. and she was literally at a center to pick up someone and take them because she was trying to help them stay out of her gym. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it's an issue nationwide as well with, with the mental health aspect, but if, are we going to increase our mental health department? Are we going to increase to, to assist in this? So you're going to see, again, this is the proposal that we're working on to, uh, next week. We actually start those internal conversations, but I can tell you. The answer to mental health is yes, we're looking to additional resources, but for police, we're at a point, especially with COVID, um, where we may need to do something quicker. So in my mind, that 10, 10, 10, 10, the, the first slug of 10 would start in the current year. And then we would add 10 effective July 1, so you'd get ahead of it. It takes a while to get, as you know, through the Train academy up. and get trained up, and we don't know what retirements are going to be this year. But the point of it is, is that there are going to be additional resources, and then we have additional resources when Jalice comes up. You know, in this area, you know, what do we do with uh, CIT and STAR and all those teams? Do they are they not about worn out right now? So uh, you're going to see all of that. On the other side, I also believe that we need to do more. You mentioned PAL. There's some other 501c3s that are out there where we can kind of. Um, get more bang for the buck, if you will, through not for profit entities in this realm, because I don't think there's one solution. I really don't. I, I, and I, I would agree with you, 
and I don't think there's a supervisor here that wouldn't agree that we need to provide just as for training for our, our fire and, and putting the money into a new training center for, for fire, which is going to be the best. We need to make sure you have the assets you need to make sure our county stays safe. And we address, Mr. Nelson and I spent nine months on the, and and that produced, we're, we're, we're going to have a rehab center, which will also help with with some of the issues you all are confronting. Uh, we're moving, and, and Mr. Manager, I, I would say whatever assets we can provide as fast as we can provide them, they need to be out there. If we need more boots on the ground, they need to be out there. Understood, sir. I would prepare to do a five or two of the new I do have one thing. What, what you're talking about, though, is the dry rehab center. This is not a mental facility or something. Say that again, Ms. Savannah. Mental health facility. You need more mental health employees. You need more well, boots on the ground. Uh, the facility. You know, that you're, yeah, I know you're talking about that. Some of them, shouldn't they go into a facility? Some of these teams, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, so yeah, I mean, the whole, you're absolutely right. You know, it was last year, year before, you've got the state basically saying all the juvenile detention centers at the state level are gone, short of two, I think, statewide. So where are those kids going? They're here, right? And then you have, you know, we took the approach where one size fits all and, okay, no kids go to detention anymore. And every now and again, you've got a kid that needs to go to detention. We had a, a child that lit another child on fire last week. Do you not, does, is there no repercussion for that? So that. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so it's Are it's a balanced approach. Yeah, although that's great. Yeah. I mean, this is something different. This is mental health. Yeah, juvenile mental illness and things. And I know we've discussed this before about um, the psychiatrists in this area were trying to get more mental health beds. Mm -hmm. And the certificate of public need said no. So that was that was only a few years ago. So that's that's all I'm asking is, so, is there ability to have a facility? Yes, ma'am. And we're actually we're we're talking to some um, some partners that are pretty significant in the uh, and I can't really get into it, but they're um, major employers, if you will, in the Commonwealth that potentially could be partners with us. Yes, first of all, thank you for the stats. Please share with Chief English that I, you know, I appreciate it. I'm sure my colleagues do too. The level of um, detail on some of these reports that we did now, we didn't get it first. So thank you. Um, how's recruiting going during, in, you know, during this COVID season though? I mean, we're going to add cops, but actually is, the, I mean, do people still have an interest, interest in being, being police? Officers. Yes, sir. So, you know, one of our, our best recruiters are individuals who already work for Henry. Uh, they love the county, and so they refer um, members of their families that want to become a police to Henry Michael first. Uh, we have a great brand. Um, and so we're still doing recruiting. We've switched off and we've gone to do virtual sessions where we get on the panel and talk for two hours to potential candidates. And it's really great because these potential candidates can be anywhere in the country. Uh, and so we're using that platform. Uh, we've also done something with public safety, but we work with fire and sheriffs and uh, animal protection. All of us got together and did an open house. Uh, we were able to bring in people who came through and actually began to do the agility test. So they began to start in their path of becoming a police officer. Uh, we have an application process currently open where we're planning on starting a class uh, come May the 28th. And we have another class scheduled till June, for June. Uh, and so we're also working on a, a modified academy. So all these three different application processes are open along with our communications. So we do have a, a plan of, you know, continue to recruit, uh, reaching out to a virtual type of sessions uh, as much as we can right now during the COVID experience. But we do still see an applicant who is interested in becoming the police, at least in New Mexico County Police. So the man mentioned COVID, is, has COVID hit you guys? 
I'm not asking you to say that you got X amount of officers out, but have you guys been hit significantly? Yes, sir. You know, given that I think it would seem like it happened right after as we as the doctors have stated, like right after Thanksgiving, we saw a surge. Uh, but now we're coming back down and I think we're getting closer back to normal. But yeah, it, it hit us as well. Yes, sir. Thank you for all that you do. Would you share with me very briefly, though, in your experience, how has after school programs helped in trying to kind of level out the crime in youngsters? Uh, I, and I've asked that question uh, as I was growing up in Richmond. I kind of knew a, a certain attitude that I had, that some of my pals had at the time, all of that. But we also had certain places we could go. So would you share with me uh, how, how, in your opinion, you think that that could be beneficial? Yes, sir, definitely. Definitely beneficial in terms of, you know, if, if the youth does not have a positive activity to engage in, uh, what they will find is a negative activity to engage in. You will have an individual being drawn to negative people, uh, potentially being, um, you know, um, stock that to become a gang member, you know, that kind of thing. So, and then by putting them in programming, it's after school, you're taking up some of their time, you're engaging in with supportive people around them who have positive things to instill in them. And I think that keeps them from going into that route of becoming, uh, going and engaging in, you know, use of alcohol and drugs and, and gang uh, and doing crimes just for the sake of, you know, we have nothing to do this positive. So I think you, you speak on a very good point, um, sir, that it is it's definitely beneficial for us to have additional things for them to do to keep them engaged and out of, uh, out of the time, you know, without something to be positive in their life or people. Interesting. I, nobody said anything. <laughs> and then they suddenly had a lot of questions for you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Next, I think Jalisa Turner. Jalisa Turner. And so that was uh, Lieutenant Colonel's first presentation before the board. Thank you. I'm sure, it's not going to be the last. So Jalisa has been before the board in the past. Welcome back again. <laughs> okay. um, so, Madam Chair, Mr. Manager, and members of the board. Um, Today, I will be discussing um, public safety's holistic approach um, to serve in the community. All right, as you guys already know, um, Henrico County's population between 2010 and 2020 increased by 8%, um, and it's projected to increase by another 9% in 2030. Um, some of that information that uh, kind of seems a little alarming is the fact that 20% um, of the total population will be individuals 65 and older. Um, so that's one in five Henrico County citizens will be, again, 65 and up. Uh, and so because of that, uh, with the changing population and diversifying and the diversity changes in the county, um, we are also trying, we're seeing an uh, evolution of the types of needs and uh, 911 service calls that we have for Henrico. Um, if you take a look at this information, I know we've talked heavily about mental health services, uh, but one that uh, Henrico Fire pulled um, was for our lift assist. Um, and our fall calls for Henrico. Um, from the year 2020, and this is my calendar year, um, from 2020 to 2021, we actually saw a 15% increase in those calls um, for individuals in the community. Uh, and so what that really, you know, there could be tons of reasons why. Um, we've seen that people are, again, aging in place and living, living longer, um, but also from 2020 to 2021, we did see an exodus of individuals moving out of long-term care facilities and back into the community. Um, and then we also are battling with some fears of individuals moving into facilities now based on upon everything that was occurring back in 2020 with the pandemic. Um, and, be, and with that, um, so what we're starting to see is as first responders go out into the community, um, we're recognizing that a lot of our residents have unmet needs. Um, and just one 911 call for service is just a short term solution uh, for a lot of long term, more complex issues uh, that our residents are facing. Okay. 
camera. That's okay. Um, and so what Henrico County has done um, with our public safety is that we are taking a non-traditional role um, to how we are now uh, communicating and interacting with the folks in the community. Um, so we're doing this by responding beyond that 911 call for service. Um, we're doing things such as uh, providing more person-centered and trauma-informed care to our folks. Um, we are Again, being proactive in the types of, um, you know, interactions or engagement uh, processes and programs that we are administering to those folks in the community, as well as coming up with more earlier, uh, you know, earlier means of intervention for these folks. Um, and then something that public safety is also doing is working across multiple agencies that are outside of public safety to ensure that we are meeting our residents where they are in their time of need. No, no that's what we're having. That's okay. <laughs> and so, uh, we need to stop here. Yeah, yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah. Very good. Not on camera. Um, <laughs> of the TV's foot, so, so, with the Division of Fire, um, you know, this is one of the agencies uh, that has implemented some programs that are that are creative and outside of what we typically or normally would do uh, as a public safety agency. Um, right here, you guys may have already heard of our basic life support ambulances or BLS ambulances. Uh, they operate Monday through Thursday from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. And what they do in the community um, is they answer some of those lower acuity or non-emergent calls for service. So those falls and lift assist calls, a lot of those are being handled by our BLS ambulances when they um, are on duty. Um, and what that's doing is freeing up our advanced life support ambulances to start responding to more um, life-threatening uh, calls that are occurring in their districts. Um, and then also we have our Community Assistance Resources and Education Program, or CARE. Um, what CARE is doing right now is it's an interdisciplinary team that's actually housed within the Division of Fire. And our entire goal is to make sure we are getting out into the community and providing supports and services to those individuals um, who need a little bit extra help. Um, and if you take a look here, um, for the fiscal year 21, we had actually received 37, uh, excuse me, 37 per request per month um, for follow-up services. Um, the care team typically gets our requests for follow-up services directly from our firefighters and medics who go out into the community. And after they make that first response to a call, what they say is, you know, this person would really benefit um, for getting you know, to get some more wraparound services out to them. And what they do is send that request to our team. Um, so the team is with, built with myself, the patient care navigator, um, a care captain, a care officer, and then also the advocate for the aging is now on our team as well. Um, if you guys can see here, uh, she has actually only been with us for six months. So since fiscal year 22, and she has already, um, She's already receiving about 35 uh, care coordination calls per month or requests per month. And then she's also um, had an attendance rate of about 383 residents um, for our programs. And that number is only looking to increase. Um, so we're trying to do a really good job of getting out there to the community um, and being able to meet them where they are. Um, I know Lieutenant Colonel already talked a lot about CIT already, um, but this is just another way uh, within uh, HPD that they are getting out into the community and providing those services for folks who are having mental health crises. Um, CIT is a part of what we call our services to aid recovery team, which is STAR. Um, and this is a multidisciplinary team or multi-agency team that really encompasses not only public safety and first responders, uh, but also we are incorporating members from uh, building inspections, community revitalization, um, Henrico County Public Schools, uh, the Department of Social Services, both Adult Protective Services and Child protective services and other advocacy groups to really start to hone in and provide services to residents um, you know who who again may need that extra support um, and so this is a way that we're able to combat or also see um, if there is a resident who's 
having multiple uh, touch points within the county, and we're working as a, an entire team uh, to make a impact on those folks. Um, real quick, one of the ways um, the STAR team actually was able to help a citizen in the community um, as a whole is the care team had received a request uh, for services um, or follow up requests uh, for an individual who was uh, falling a lot in the community and also they happened to have a hoarding situation. Um, and so what the care team did was bring that to the star team um, and we all discussed it. Um, and during that discussion, we decided, okay, this requires a joint team effort to make sure that this citizen, or excuse me, this resident is receiving the services um, they really truly need to be safe in the community. Uh, so we all went out there. It was care from so the division of fire, um, police, building inspections, and we all kind of you know provided our um, expertise to these individuals. Um, once we were there, we were able to help them get connected to physical therapy and occupational therapy to help with uh, the falls for fall prevention. Um, we were able to uh, actually work with social services uh, through their crisis assistance program, and we were able to get their HVAC system completely replaced. Um, so that's just one of the, or, one example of the way that we work together um, as the STAR team. Oh, and one more thing, the hoarding situation, uh, we work with uh, community revitalization to get them a roll off dumpster so that the home could be um, cleaned. And so it was, it, was it was actually a success. They were able to clean the home. So it was a good uh, turnout and just another way that STAR works in the community to help folks out. Um, Another program that, again, is more community based uh, where we are going out there and and or allowing folks to come to us um, is through Henrico Mental Health. Um, one of the programs that they have there is our same day access program, um, which it allows folks to or a person who's in need of mental health services or evaluation. They can come right into um, Henrico Mental Health. Excuse me. And write the mental health as a walk in um, during those hours of operation. Um, and so, what we've seen just based upon these community based services is that uh, the emergency pre screens for psych hospitalizations, um, TDOs, and also uh, folks who are going to the crisis receiving center, those numbers are now decreasing. So, this is almost a direct correlation to what benefit and what that impact is that we're having at the CIT level, at the care team level, and at mental health level of same day access and different programs um, by making sure we're getting these services out to folks, we're kind of preventing these interactions with the hospital and with the criminal justice system. And I know because we, you know, this is, a, I'm from the Division of Fire, and of course this is an HPD slogan, but because we are truly um, all working together uh, to make Henrico County a better place, um, we are truly one team, one community, and we are all safer together. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? <laughs> Anybody have a question? No, I that. Last time I said that, they said no, and then suddenly. <laughs> I won't say anything this time. Thank you for that. And, and Thank and you. I have a, just a quick question about hoarding. I've got so much of that going on. It, what exactly can be done? Yes. When there's so in a lot of our hoarding situations, um, hoarding is a mental health. Uh, it has a mental health correlation or there's a mental health piece. So what we try to do at the county is not only connect them with services like same day access, because there may be some unresolved traumas. There may be there are different things. People are going through different life stages. Um, and so we try to connect them to resources there, but also um, we, there are some programs within the county that we try to see if they qualify for them. Like I said, the one, there's one within community revitalization or roll off dumpster program um, and just different things like that. Uh, but, you know, we're always open to speaking with those individuals to see if we can right size the approach. Um, for them. They usually don't want any help. That's the problem. That is correct. That uh, actually goes through community revitalization. They, it starts usually there, but okay. If there's a safety component that's attached to it, um, and we're, you know, if 
folks are starting to see that there's a decline, uh, what we then try to do is connect them potentially, maybe it's an adult protective services case or something that we'll have to do okay. to kind of intervene with that. Um, but it, uh, it is a case by case, uh, or it's on a case by case basis. So if you have a request, please be sure to send it away, okay? <laughs> I won't call the community revitalization. <laughs> Any other questions? I've got a question for us because um, I'm looking for any update because it was a year ago we, we talked about one subject that didn't have to do with this. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your information. Chair, especially. Okay. So, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, thank you, Lisa. So, as we finish, those are all the presentations that we had. But, Fred, before you turn us off, I'm going to ask Carrie Tretina. Uh, to come forward and take us through wrap up. And so the reason I want to do that is because we were going through, there was a lot that you all went through and she's been keeping a list of items as far as uh, work items. So Carrie, you want to, you want to, and if you're okay with that approach, that's sure. That's great. All right, Carrie, take us through that. Yes, so good. You want me to go first or you want to go first, Carrie? Preference, sir. Don't ever give me the preference. Um, uh, can someone update me on one year ago when we did our retreat? Um, we talked about GRTC, about all of the money we put into GRTC, all the money that that, and we don't have a seat, we don't have a voice to control our own destiny, and we were going to last year retreat. We were going to go after. And and at least since we're the highest contributor, have a voice in GRTC. Have we gotten anywhere with that? Because I have not heard a peep about GRTC. So um, yes and no, Mr. Brand. And sadly, it's taken that long to navigate. Um, I guess it's the political, and then they. So what we have right now, and it was. Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Nelson that engaged in um, conversations with their counterparts that uh, started because the administrators were not able, able to bring forward a solution. So what was happening was we basically, Henrico, um, provided all sorts of flexibility. We're okay with this approach. We're okay with this approach. We're okay with this approach. We just want to be on the board. And then others started worrying about details that quite frankly don't matter. But fast forward where we are right now is the city is getting ready to introduce a ordinance. Uh, Lincoln Saunders is uh, the problem that I foresee right now is that there's still some disagreement south of the river and it sounds like the electives were okay. The administrators okay and now. Um, I don't want to divulge too much, but the, the staff is having some difficulty with the proposal at the uh, attorney level. So, um, so far, do you have anything new from the conversations that you've had with Mr. Mix? Yes. Those changes that be defined by the chief administrative officers. We've discussed those concerns and we've agreed with the three. But to be clear, you as the county attorney didn't have any concern with the proposal that was no. put forward. No. So again, it's it's two steps forward, one step backwards. Mr. Nelson. It, it, I'll bring you up to pace because I, I asked the question one year ago. We put right. forward that GRTC like with the amount of money we're tip. putting into it like as a county. We need to have a voice. I know you were we're we're banging that drum. We all were banging that drum, and I just asked to find out where are we at with it because it's gone quiet. So, are 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 we going to finally have a vote in GRTC? That's the intent, Mr. Brandon. We absolutely are. Um, the city has started the process. It's gotten sidetracked in Chesterfield. I would expect that, you know, that will get back on track. 
because there's no possible reason for it not to, but it has taken a year for something that is pretty simple. Yes. What What is that? Uh, well, I know Dan and I, I feel like we, uh, you know, honestly, there's been so much stuff going on. I actually forgot about you on TCU. You did. We stepped out. We oh, spread, yeah. Mr. Nelson, correct me if I'm wrong. We met with the electors. It was just us. And we feel like yeah. we came out in a good place. We had some conversations that closed that up. We left We left with an agreement. We gave, yeah, we did. We gave it back to the administrators. They buttoned it up pretty quickly. I thought within a week we had an update. Um, the administrators the are, are, are clear. There's no issue. Fine details are getting hammered out. Um, I, I would say this. Knowing the amount of hurdles that we've overcome to get to here, I have confidence we can get this done. Uh, all the electeds have said that they agree in principle to what we have discussed. I think I haven't seen the changes. Okay. Then I'll reserve. We're getting hopefully close. Any further comments in regards to it? Well, I mean, if you circle back in a month or two and we're not there, yeah. honestly, you're bringing it up right now is not bad. I mean, because this, it, it's mid jan and it's, it's not the manager's fault. I mean, this is oh, mid -Jan this mid January. We actually had a discussion that did not include administrators. So we all left out feeling like um, we were on one accord. And then once the message got back to one of our um, region boards, stuff just started getting all crazy again. So we just want an equal representation. Dan, if I can remember, it was three things. It was it was equal representation on the board. Yes. It it was uh it wasn't even we initially went in and said we didn't even really care about the whole stop thing. But one of the localities was pushing for us to have a stop uh, percentage. And then the third thing was what? The third thing was like power over um, the your local. own jurisdictions yeah. routing mm -hmm. decisions. Board makeup, voting yeah. power on routes, and then voting percentages on certain items on budgeting versus. It, it really, it, honestly, the issues are not hard. They were not. They were not. So you just sit down and use common sense. They're probably pretty simple. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't that easy. But it was not. It wasn't process. It wasn't that easy process. process. It wasn't something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I, I tell you what. Uh, my, my recommendations. My, my personal opinions. I will withhold for uh, another month. Mr. Manager, do you have any idea what the hangups are in Chesterfield? Not, yes, sir. I mean, we're not asking you to speak to it right now. No, I, I spoke to it. You had stepped out. So oh, okay. The hangup is uh, with the county attorney right now, which is uh, in Chesterfield. Yes, sir. And sure. so I just asked our attorney, do you have any issues with what we have proposed? No. So every now and again, and this is no, um, Tom and I have had this conversation many times. County attorney is there to advise you on legal matters, not managerial issues. And so there are policy issues that come from either the administration or the legislative branch. And this is where I think the staff, so your hurdle was initially what? Was um, political. You got past that. It was the administrative. Then you got past that. You got past the political. And now That's right. it's all of a sudden. You know, I, and I don't know how that happens because it absolutely would not happen here. I can tell you that. Yeah, that is so that that is exactly the way it is. It usually goes the other way, right? It's usually staff and then administrative and then it's, then it's political, right? And this has gone the other way. I right? think we solved the political thing, the administrators solved their thing, and now we got the last piece. But I hope to be able to bring you uh, soon the names of two elected officials on this board and then a member of the staff to have uh, serve on that body. That's the intent. Okay, thank you for the update, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, so I'll uh, be very brief. I've categorized these into board actions and items for further consideration or work session. So we'll start, start with the actions. Um, these are either ordinances or resolutions. So uh, going in order of the agenda, 
Oh, that feels nice. New tax category for research and development. So that will be part of the budget adoption for 23. And we heard the feedback of below a dollar and we're happy to, to calculate that information. An Innsbruck technology zone in the early spring of this year, we'll need to amend the zoning ordinance to add the pup process for solar farms. As uh, we also heard concurrence with the siting agreements with the upfront payment, and that's kind of a unique per project. And then the 1600 per megawatt um, for those siting agreements. We also got concurrence for specifically the federal funded utility infill projects that they would be able to utilize the county credits for sewer. Um, we also heard within that presentation concurrence for the uh, county contract for the plumber. Um, and as well as a commitment within the budget and the manager's proposed budget for a continuation of those infill projects. So the county contract for the what? For the on-site plumber, so a fixed rate for the piece that the resident would be responsible for. Very similar to bulky waste, how we handle that now. <clears throat> uh, in the realm, realm of um, uh, finance, we'll be very busy very quickly. So uh, Tuesday's meeting, you will have the intro to the tax credit. Um, and then that will be adopted in February to move forward on that calendar that Ms. Miner showed us. Also, um, for the budget uh, adoption, the manager's proposed budget will be bringing forward the rate reduction of two cent. And then uh, in the referendum, we have a schools action uh, that we'll be asking the school board to consider uh, um, in February, along with um, our uh, piece in, in the last part of February, the second meeting of February is when our uh, referendum resolution will come forward. Then items for further consideration or work sessions uh, prior to Tuesday, it sounds like, or this week, we will need to have that evaluation of Johnson um, Elementary School and how that can fit into the holiday number. Uh, we also heard uh, further consideration within the bond referendum research um, is the water, water park scope and better refine um, that CIP request Deep bottom scope reconciliation. We'll just need to make sure that the, the Henrico Navy is not included in that project. And also, um, we heard some refinement of the public information campaign as we get closer to that date that is tattooed um, on Brandon Hinton's body. Also, for further work sessions, uh, we will have the spec building for the wet lab, um, which we also heard feedback is trying to figure out how uh, that square footage can exceed 100,000. Uh, square feet uh, also within EDA is the EDA agreements. And then also, I think I heard this right. Once we get close to green city CDA, maybe a, a work session on that structure. <clears throat> um, into utilities further evaluation of how the streetlight program using um, a different funding source outside of the sanitary districts. We bring it back, bringing that back this year as well. Um, in uh, the no kill shelter, we need to find a new name for that. Um, and also we'll be bringing a work session for the uh, Humane Society as well as our animal protection unit and the Woodman Animal Shelter. Uh, a report out from the uh, what we're calling the Youth Crime and Violence Committee in relation to the manager's proposed budget that will come around budget um, introduction as well. And then the ad hoc item of a 30 day follow up on GRTC. And then there's uh, will be a follow up letter that Holly and I will be working on, which will have some of the other additional information that was requested, like how many uh, campus style schools, some of the information about the landfill solar project off of tuxedo. Those will also be included as well. And that uh, concludes my wrap up. I have a question. Oh, you have a question. Yeah. Karen, is there any way that you can put that in the card? Yes, sir. It will be in the follow up letter that will hit your packet no later than Thursday. Take it. Someone takes good notes. And I just, I think Mr. Nelson's recommendation for for the no kill is fantastic. And I do have one comment that I want to make. That, um, this has been happening. I, I guess people know my cell phone number, but I've been getting text messages with questions during the day. And um, this has happened, and I mentioned it um, to, to a couple people, but I wanted everybody to hear that during a zoning case I had at the board meeting. And I was talking and it was time to, to pull it together for a vote and I was explaining why I was going to vote. I suddenly got pinged about five times from people who were texting me about what they wanted me to do with this zoning case at that late hour. So I was thinking that, that we might possibly need some sort of um, method to close out the discussion, but 
um, you know, not sure how to handle it with technology the way it is now. You know, I mean, they were texting me right in the middle of my speech on I was going to move to approve it, and they were saying you've got to change this or do that. And Turn I thought, where were these people when? Turn your phone <laughs> off. <Pat. laughs> Turn problem. your phone off. How long do you wait to take you know input from your residents? I mean, that's just what I'm saying. They've been texting me. I don't see how questions. I don't see how we're going to. I don't see how we can control it unless we turn our devices off. Okay. I mean, other than that, people are going to yeah. use every avenue that they can to get in contact with us. And I, and I, and I don't think right go and and this board don't have community meetings, community input. Week. Signs are up for for months. I was surprised that suddenly turn it off. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, Mr. Manager, um again with the one dollar, so Brandon suggested ninety-eight and ninety-six, and we tossed them around some stuff. You're gonna do you're gonna I mean, is there any way that we can make that? I, you know, he was talking about 25 cents, but not. I, I, no, I, yeah, but I'm not saying 25 cents, but I mean, can we make it so that it really is significant, you know, below and not, I'm not saying 50 cents or anything like that. I'm just saying not just two or three cents for somebody else to come back and change. Let us look, yeah. let us look. So we know we can do the minimum half, right? And I'm just rough numbers. 98. Yeah, we don't even have to lift. Can we go to 90? Let's see. Yeah, let me just run the numbers and it then... seems like every time we've. Taken that route, mm -hmm. it looks like it looks like we have. It has worked in our favor. Right. Yeah. Any other comments? I mean, we did go over just a few minutes. I just want to say thank you to everybody who did a report today. We've had a long day and, and gone through a tremendous amount of material and. Um, excellent questions and everybody paid attention and I do appreciate lunch. <laughs> that was helpful. Um, but I, I really just want to thank everybody, the technology that and things go a little bit askew, but we got it. We got it back and I think it worked very well. How many people do we did we have do we have now or fifty seven now, but even now. Okay. At, the, at the peak, what was the highest point you think? About eighty two. Okay. All right. Well, Dana, Dana said that since Christy's still here the whole time, and that was such a <laughs> phenomenon. Dan says he owes you, and he's going to come and sit through an entire school board retreat. Did I say that? Did I say that? <laughs> you don't need to come to school. Sorry. So thank you, Mr. Man, and thank you everyone that spent a whole Saturday uh, on this retreat. Members of the board, if you ever wonder about. You know why we continue to do what we do. It's the staff, and you are so. Uh, your bench is so so deep here. Um, I just want to say thank you. Hey, thank everyone, you, drive sir. safely, and because we want to see you back here what Monday. <laughs> thank you. Meeting adjourned.